Hello, and uh, welcome to another edition of Learning and Behavior. For those of you who have gotten sick and tired of having me talk about Pavlovian conditioning, I have a bit of good news for you. <laughs> We're going to move on to talk about instrumental or operant conditioning. And, uh, uh, and uh, that begins with the story of uh, Edward Thorndike. But before we get to uh, talk about Thorndike, uh, let's review what the critical concepts are, or critical features of an instrumental conditioning situation that makes it different from Pavlovian conditioning. In Pavlovian conditioning, <clears throat> one of the things we have not discussed, but um, is, uh, is a pervasive feature of Pavlovian conditioning procedures, is there is no response requirement. Uh, the conditioned stimulus is presented, followed by the unconditioned stimulus. The unconditioned stimulus comes whenever it's scheduled to occur. Uh, the or organism doesn't have to do anything to produce it. Uh, there is no particular response that has to happen in order for any of the procedures to play out. And one of the interesting things, of course, is that behavior emerges nevertheless. So in a sense, Pavlovian conditioning is represents the adjustments of organisms to situations that they don't have any control over. <clears throat> in contrast, in an uh, instrumental or operant conditioning situation, a response is required to produce an unconditioned stimulus, like food or shock, for example. Uh, so if the, uh, or if the subject doesn't make the response, the food doesn't appear. So a response is required. The focus is on response rates uh, rather than response probability. Uh, and uh, of course, to make the lives of students more difficult, there is a different set of technical terms. For one thing, the unconditioned stimulus is not called a US. It's called a reinforcer, uh, casually referred to it as a reward. Now, all this began with the work of Edward Thorndike in the United States. So instrumental or Pavlovian or uh, uh, operant conditioning is an American invention. If we may have the next slide. Edward Thorndike was very much captivated by uh, the question that Darwin posed, namely, how does intelligence evolve? And he took Darwin's suggestion of uh, uh, studying the evolution of intelligence by looking at uh, learning in various species of animals in contrast to how Darwin uh, provided evidence for the evolution of learning. Thorndike uh, uh, was uh, very uh, intent on uh, doing true experiments. He didn't want to rely on anecdotal evidence of learning in various uh, instances of animal behavior. He wanted to see exactly how learning occurs in a laboratory in a highly controlled situation. And for that um, reason, he invented uh, what uh, a series of puzzle boxes. And the initial uh, results of these experiments, puzzle box experiments, made up uh, the PhD dissertation that he submitted to Columbia University. And this was published in 1898. So Thorndike's work uh, uh, that we're gonna talk about today is more than a hundred years old. And why that's interesting, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you at the end. Uh, so if we may uh, look at the next slide, in order to study uh, intelligence or intelligent behavior, Thorndike in, uh, created a series of puzzle boxes. So these were boxes that animals were placed in and they had to make a response to get out. Uh, in many of these experiments, young uh, cats served as, uh, as experimental subjects. The, when the kitten was put into the box, you had to figure out how to operate a latch or something. Uh, to get out in uh, box I, for example, on the left here, he has to uh, press what looks kind of like a lever. That's uh, remarkably similar to this Skinnerian 
uh, lever press situation. In uh, box A, uh, the kitten had to pull a loop and uh, that uh, lifted a, 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 a pin that then allowed the door to fall open and then the kitten got out and got a piece of fish. Pretty cool, huh? So <laughs> the next slide shows the kind of data that uh, Thorndike got out of these kinds of experiments. You'll notice that the axes aren't labeled and it's uh, pretty, uh, uh, it's not the kind of data presentation that uh, we require uh, these days. Uh, but what he's showing you is the latency for the kitten to uh, get out of the box, this was box A, across trials. And initially the cat was fairly slow in getting out and then it got quicker and quicker. And um, uh, uh, this uh, learning curve uh, showed in this particular case, uh, quite rapid, rapid learning. And uh, many of the boxes, uh, puzzle boxes that uh, Thorndike tested um, showed results of this sort. So the next question is, uh, uh, next question that Thorndike addressed, you know, he collected all these empirical data. How do we make sense of these experiment, ex empirical data? What principle might be governing the learning or that's going on here? What might the kittens be learning? And the next slide shows Thorndike's analysis. And Thorndike's analysis really was uh, quite uh, insightful, highly insightful. <laughs> in that uh, he analyzed the instrumental conditioning situation as having three critical components. The first critical component is that the kitten was put in the box. And uh, so there are a unique set of stimuli that the kitten encounters at the beginning of the training trial. Then the kitten has to make a response, uh, pull the loop to release the pin or something else to open the door. And having made that response, the door opens and he can get a piece of food, which is the response outcome. So one of the really important things that Thorndike gave us, which we still use today, is this um, uh, analysis of the instrumental conditioning situation as involving three components, a stimulus, a response, and a response outcome. And then he considered what was learned in this situation that enabled the kitten to get out of the box more quickly. And uh, that uh, his answer to that question is what uh, we now know as the law of effect. Uh, he stated it as a law of learning, called it the law of effect. And uh, the law of effect uh, it has uh, gotten kind of lost in the sense that people assume that they know what the law of effect is and they kind of write about it and make up the story about it and they're often incorrect about it. <laughs> often what people uh, uh, say the law of effect is is that um, having uh, made this response and gotten out of the box and gotten the, uh, 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 the reinforcer, a piece of food, the animals learn an association between the response and the response outcome. That is, people assume that animals are learning an RO association, and they characterize the law of effect as the learning of an RO association. Well, that's not what Thorndike talked about, and that's not the law of effect. I was really amazed when uh, I was reading a chapter by Daniel Schachter, who's a very prominent uh, psychologist studying learn uh, memory mechanisms at Harvard University, distinguished professor, wrote a chapter for uh, uh, the Principles of Neuroscience book, which is a huge compendium of, uh, of uh, state-of-the-art state knowledge about neuroscience. And in this chapter, he wrote about the law of effect. And he wrote about the law of effect as, as being an RO association. So he was wrong about it. And the other thing that just blew me away is that he cited a, a previous uh, book that I'd published uh, as, the, uh, as the authority for the claim that the law of effect is an RO association. Well, if he had actually read the book instead of just cited it, he would have realized that the RO association is not the law of effect. So if we might go back to the slide, the uh, <clears throat> law of effect involves an association between stimuli S, that is the stimuli of being in the puzzle box and the response that's made. That's the law of effect and that's what 
Thorndike uh, uh, proposed as the explanation for how the kittens were learning to get out of the box. Now, why did Thorndike uh, focus on this SR association? Well, the reason he did, he wanted a mechanistic account for what made the animal operate the latch to get out. So he wanted to, to uh, identify the cause of the response. Well, the cause of the response has to be an experience or an event that occurs prior to the response. And S was the prior event being put in the box. So if, this, if you form an association between stimuli S and the response, then as soon as you're in that box, you make the response and uh, you're off to the races. If you uh, attribute learning to an RO association, that does not explain why the response occurs because the, there's no antecedent to R. And uh, it's not like uh, somehow uh, you're, you think about the reinforcer or the response outcome. You, uh, the RO association suggests that uh, you don't think about the reinforcer until after you've made the response. And having made the response, that then activates your memory of the uh, response outcome. But it doesn't tell you why the response occurs in the first place. So <clears throat> the law of effect is an SR association. It's not an R, uh, RO association. And uh, the uh, detailed statement on the bottom uh, describes exactly how Thorndike put it. Uh, he said that the satisfying outcome following a response served to strengthen the association between that response and the stimuli in the presence of which that response was made. And this is the SR association. So why is this so interesting? And why is this so interesting 100 years, more than 100 years after Thorndike talked about it? Well, the next slide shows you the uh, cover of two books that were published uh, in recent years. The uh, first of these, The Power of Habit, was written by Charles Duhigg in uh, 2014, and it became a bestseller. Charles Duhigg was a science writer for the New York Times, and uh, he wrote this book about what uh, is responsible for habits. And you know what the book is about? It's all about the SRO formulation that Thorndike proposed and the importance of the SR association. And Duhigg is essentially uh, <clears throat> describing how uh, our contemporary thinking about habits uh, relies on the kind of SR association Thorndike initially identified. Uh, <clears throat> more recently, in 2019, Wendy Wood, who is uh, a professor at uh, U University of California, uh, Southern California, USC, <laughs> out in Los Angeles, uh, in a business school, she's also been studying habits, wondering, you know, what makes you uh, uh, habitual behavior, what is responsible for habitual behavior in uh, human beings. He was not, he's not interested in cats or anything. And her book is also based entirely on Thorndike's law of effect. So uh, Thor Thorndike's law of effect, when it is correctly interpreted, continues to play a tremendously important role in how we think about human behavior and instrumental behavior in particular. Uh, more than 100 years after uh, the law of effect was proposed. So my challenge to you is that you not only go to graduate school and get a PhD, but you should do experiments for your PhD that turn out to be so important that those experiments and your analysis of those experiments continues to be talked about for well over 100 years after you submit your dissertation. So good luck with that, and uh, I will see you next time. Thank you.